Hello, everybody, and welcome to Notes from Hollywood on Promo Homo TV. I am your host, Nicholas Snow, and uh, I'm so excited to bring you a very important broadcast. Uh, you know, I just want to put this opening quote the, uh, on the screen again. So with the assault on the transgender community on the rise across the globe, especially in the United States. It is more important than ever that we elevate and fight for the humanity of those who put the T in LGBTQ. And this is something I strive to do in my, in my series on an ongoing basis. Uh, and today's broadcast is bittersweet because there's this assault on the trans community, uh, and yet there are strides that are being made and uh, this show is featuring a, a wonderful filmmaker and uh, she's backstage and interestingly, I didn't ask her how to pronounce her last name. So hopefully I got it right. Uh, Ira Storosinko's live action film, Juliet focuses on a transgender teenager who hopes to play Juliet in Romeo and Juliet at uh, her high school. This is a powerful short, I've seen it, and it was inspired by the director and producer's experiences with gender discrimination uh, in the past. And the film has screened at multiple film festivals, including the Oscar qualifying AFI Fest in 2020 and Indie Short Fest, where it won the 2020 Best Student LGBTQ Short Award. And Juliet will be screening at the 2021 Manchester Film Festival. And I imagine that's still ahead of us, but maybe it's already happened. We'll find out from our fabulous filmmaker in just a few moments. Um, I just want to let you know that if you are watching live and you have a comment or a question, I can feature you uh, on screen like this. So if you're watching live and you wanna interact, I encourage you to do that. Um, and for their support of my show, I wanna thank as usual, DAP Health, serving uh, Riverside County. Uh, they're specifically based in the Coachella Valley in Palm Springs, California. I happen to be living with HIV DAP Health is formerly known as Desert AIDS Project, but now over half of their clients are people who are not living with HIV. They've be become a broad-based healthcare organization. I encourage you to check them out. Also for their support, 849 Restaurant and Lounge. And uh, if my guest and I were in the same city, that's where we'd be going for lunch. Uh, so uh, I owe you one, Ira. Um, for those of you outside the area, I've been authorized by Palm Springs Pride to tell you to save the date for the Pride celebration this year. I'm the official broadcaster of the parade. So wherever you are in the world, you can watch here. But we're far enough along in our recovery from the pandemic that we know something is happening in real life. And that would usually happen, the big events at the end of the weekend, which is no, at the end of the week, which is the weekend of November 5th through 7th. In the Coachella Valley, if you're feeling like you want more connection to the LGBTQ community, check out the centercv.org for the LGBTQ Community Center of the Desert. And uh, Promo Homo TV official merch is now on Amazon. Send me a photo with you and the merch. And with your permission, I will put it in the show. And uh, beginning in June, late June, actually, I'm starting a limited episodic series here on Promo Homo TV, focusing on my living powerfully with HIV memoir, Life Positive, A Journey to the Center of My Heart. Check that book out if you want to follow along with the special series. And in the book, I write about the creation of an HIV testing safer sex awareness campaign. The video for The Power to Be Strong is subtitled in 21 languages on YouTube, and you can even ask your smart speaker to play it. Now, for all of Arena's director friends who tune in today, I am an actor, so please check out my clips at promohomo.tv slash actor. And uh, I want to thank for their support of my show. The show actually wouldn't be possible without the support of the superstars, and here's more about them.
And you can find the superstars link at promohomo.tv as well. And you get a listing and a link at the website if you subscribe for as little as $3 a month. So in the green room, I have a young director, and this is her first broadcast interview ever. And I'm going to welcome her to this show right after this. <music> And as promised uh, to her uh, first broadcast interview, I'm happy to welcome Irina Ar Storosenko. Hi, how are you? Hi. Hi, Nicholas. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. Did I say your name right? Yeah, absolutely. It's Storosenko, but you know, yeah. Storosenko. Yes, yes. Okay, yes. well, I will, it I will say close. it correctly yeah. going on. Storosenko. <laughs> Yes. Storozhenko. Okay. Welcome to your first interview. I was so surprised to know that this is your first interview because you have a great publicist uh, as a result of your film, Juliet. Yeah. Perhaps that's because you're connected to the AFI program. Um, but uh, I, I've, I've had you booked on the show for quite a while, and I'm so happy that it's happening. I'm especially happy that it's happening because there's just such an assault on the trans community right now. Um, and it's important to spotlight uh, anything that helps elevate the humanity and lives of, of these people. Um, tell me, uh, I'm going to show the trailer of your film, but tell me anything that you would like to say about um, having had the opportunity to make this particular film before I show the trailer. Yeah, I what I really would like to mention is that um, this story existed for a long time and in my head uh, it has gone through transitions, you know, the plot changed, but the core, the idea was always, um, you know, I've been thinking about it for a long time, I believe like since I probably was like 18 years old and I just really emphasized that only in AFI I had an opportunity, like after I came to the United States and I was accepted in AFI conservatory, I got the opportunity to finally tell the story uh, with support and with a very, you know, uh, with great support from the creative side and creative mentors. Uh, back in Russia, when I would be talking to people, producers or mentors about uh, telling the story, that would be a no-go. Um, and I just cannot be more happy that the story finally made it to the screen and then people can watch it. That's that's very important to me. Well, let's watch the trailer and we'll be back to discuss the film and your fascinating career right after this. So I watched the film last night, and uh, it was a very emotional experience. And my experience of short films in general is there's often something very powerful at the end, and I won't say what is at the end of your film that's very powerful. But if I wasn't already crying, I was crying then. So thank you for creating this piece of art. Um, one of the things that I find fascinating about your story in particular is that you are from a country where there's such a great deal of oppression in so many different ways. And yet you are, albeit in another country, brave and bold enough to really conquer issues that you could not conquer at home. Um, and, uh, but your, your work has already captured attention in Russia. So tell me a little bit about your history as an artist 
and the new freedoms that you perhaps are experiencing now? Um, speaking about experience I had in Russia, I can mention that I, I guess I, I've been and I'm staying still. I'm, all, I, I'm a fighter, so I decided to uh, get into film school when I was 16, and um, there is a sort of a stereotype in Russia for, especially for young women, that in order to be a director, you have to gain life experience. And um, it's just very rare when they would be accepting you at the early age, like 16 or 17, you know. Um, we have slightly different um, education system in Russia. So you go uh, to your bachelor after you graduate 11th grade. And uh, I happened to be 16. I was a bit younger than most of my peers. Uh, and uh, I really had to prove every day that I can be a director, that I can tell the stories. And most importantly, I have stories to tell. Um, my short I, I made in Russia was concentrated also on, um, you know, female problems and their self-esteem. Uh, and I guess it's also important to say that every movie I'm doing, I always do it as a message to people whom I love, to people whom I care about. And it's more about encouraging everyone to you know, gain self-esteem and believe in themselves. Um, at the age of 23, I decided to... Um, I was always fascinated by the quality uh, in American filmmaking and that the product is always like, you know, I would say probably that's the best, the highest quality in the world. And I decided to try and apply to American Film Institute and uh, get the master program in there because I've heard a lot about the school and uh, I knew it's going to be challenging, but I also knew that it's probably going to be very, very important for me in order to develop my creative voice. Uh, and I came into the United States, I think, four months before applying to the program because I, I didn't know the language. I couldn't speak English. <laughs> so I had four months. Well, you've, and you've, you've learned quickly. I had to. I didn't have any other choice. And I also would say that it's, I am lucky enough that I passed the English test. Uh, I was surprised because I didn't think I could do that back then. And um, I got accepted immediately into a five conservatory. I remember myself just calling my dad and crying because I still couldn't believe that it was all happening to me. That's a beautiful story. Uh, now, I noticed in the credits that the executive producer of your film, Juliet, shares your last name. Is that your dad who executive produced the film? Yes, it is my dad. It's, it's, uh, it's very common, I would say, uh, in AFI as well, that uh, your parents are supporting you when you are making your thesis. And uh, there is a rule that after, you know, certain amount of money which people are donating, they will be your executive producers. And, uh, you know, I can just only say that my dad is a strong Russian man. Sometimes we fight, uh, but on a creative level, he's very supportive. And I do like that he has an ability to grow up and uh, extend his vision on the world. I understand it's very, you know, if you were born in Soviet Union and you were raised in Soviet Union, where we're talking about oppression, which is happening right now, back then, almost everything was forbidden, you know, people would be wearing the same clothes, there would be no jeans, you know, <laughs> and things like that. I do really admire how he evolves his mind and how he gets you know, to know me more, to know my art more, and um, that I have an opportunity to prove him that things can be different in the world. And it's just everyone has the right to be happy and to be here. So I, I find it incredibly inspiring that your dad supported your making of a film of, uh, about a, a a trans woman, a, tra a young trans girl and her journey in a way that would cause the audience to feel sympathetic about the issue. Uh, that just seems like a huge leap for most people, your uh, Russian men, your father's age. Yes, and that's exactly what I'm talking about. I guess the the most important part of this whole process to me is that he trusts me and he trusts my vision and uh you know it wasn't ever like it wasn't always like that uh i did my first documentary short when i was 17 and it was about the opera singer um the overweight opera singer who um 
she was trying to gain her self-esteem again. I, I guess that's that's just my, you know, the, the, the most um, interesting topic for me. And I think my mom told him that um, filming a short the documentary about the woman who is going to the strip club. That was the that was a twi twist in the story. She would be an opera singer, but she would be going in a strip club to see how women there like they're free and they're dancing and they have all this you know female power. And he got very mad at me. He called me. He said like Ira, if you're filming a movie about the stripper, you're doing it wrong. You should never do that. And I told him I said. Uh, hey, I'm already doing that. Uh, there is no way you can stop me, especially with documentaries. Uh, uh, you don't need much money to do documentary, especially on that level when I was back then. And then he came to the screening and he watched the movie. And then after that, I think that was the very important moment in our relationships because he came to me and he said, he said, I think, I think we're doing everything right. I think, because he was also against at some point, um, uh, he was very against uh, of the idea of me being a director and going to film school. You know, there are so many stereotypes in, in Russia that if you are a filmmaker, you are either a drug addict, you know, or you're a crazy person, especially for people who are not from that industry. And that first movie, I guess, proved to him that I can make something very light and very encouraging for people, and I can do it on a certain level that people will be interested to watch. And I do think that after that, he revaluated his attitude and you know his his relationships with me and um right now it's mostly conversations about you know how we rarely discuss uh you know nitty gritty of the storytelling because he doesn't know much about that but we do discuss main ideas and how film can make the world to be a better place and in this case he's always very supportive yes and what did I didn't know we would spend so much time on your dad, but I think it's Sorry. fascinating. No, no, I was I'm the one that I don't apologize. I'm the one that has gone here because and and if if you're watching Ira's dad, thank you, really from the bottom of my heart. Uh, there's so much hope that comes from uh, that that is created when someone like you is supportive of your daughter the way that you are when so many other parents would not do the same thing. Uh, you would be looked to as a hero, and in fact you are, sir, so thank you. That's my personal message to your dad. Um, but I just think that it, that's so important. Now, uh, the film Juliet uh, is inspired by the personal experiences of gender discrimination among the creative team. So talk a little bit about that and, and tell me how you came to meet the team members and collaborate. So the whole idea of the Juliet um, was finally born uh, when I met uh, an incredible actress, Jasmine Mozabar. I got a chance to work with her on my first year in AFI. And we were talking about, you know, issues with self-esteem and how it affects your work and how it blocks you on the creative level. And then she told me about her, her moments in her life when she was transitioning, but she would be in theater and how painful that experience was to her. And um, it just struck me. I, 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 I was also attending a school theater when I was young and I had, uh, I had, I was bullied a lot. Uh, I back then I, you know, being a um, non-gender person or lesbian in Russia, it's still, you know, a tricky part. Uh, but back then it it wasn't, I guess, socially normal even in creative field. Uh, and Jasmine's experience overlapped with my own experience, and I just started talking to her more and more, and I. I uh, said to her, she's a consultant on this movie, and uh, Jasmine, if you're watching that, thank you so much for all your work and your creative input. We started developing the story, and then uh, there was a time in AFI when you have to choose your team members, but it's basically you have to approach people and pitch them your story. And if they like your story, if they are interested to work with you, they will say yes. If they don't, then you know they just go and team up with some other director. And I wanted to work with Catherine because I knew that she's a very sensitive person, and I knew that uh, she, she, she's, she was 
the one who saw all this gender uh, discrimination in Russia. She, she's also from Russia. I pitched her the story and she almost cried. And she said to me, yes, I want to do that. So that was amazing to have a, a very strong producer on my side who understands the story and who understands you know, the emotional core of the story. And then uh, Sarah, our cinematographer, she has been in school theater and she was bullied uh, in the school theater at some point in her life. So she came up with this you know, creative vision of how do you feel, how does Chimera can translate of how do you feel when you are bullied by people and theatrical universe. Uh, Delandre is the mother of two kids and she just knows a lot about this generation of kids. Um, and Anna, our editor, she got on board um, with her own idea, you know, how to make the story short. Um, but I think the most important part to me was to have all the strong women who understand the story and have Jasmine on board who would be coming and consulting and saying to me what, what, you know, what exactly I can add to make it feel more authentic and natural. And the most important part, this movie would never happen without Reese Alexander. Uh, the collaboration circle wasn't complete until we meet her. Uh, she's an incredible talent. She's, she's very gifted and she's very honest and open and uh, from, I, I think from the first conversation with her, I I just knew that, you know, she will tell the story and she will elevate it on a different level. Um, and I think that during all this time, it's a pretty long time actually for the short movie, you have certain time for development, then you have um, pre-production, which is normally like two months and then you have production the fastest part four days you're done and then you go into post-production so with Reese um, it was amazing how quickly she became a part of the team and how I guess it's just it's always feels so great when you have an actor who understands you and who allows you to understand them and who is very sensitive but a very hard worker and at this point, I just, I was very excited before the first day because I knew that Reese and I are going to finally meet on set and we're just going to go there and create. And that was amazing. That's a lot. So um, who, who in this story is lesbian? Who among who among the collaborators is lesbian identified? Je 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 Jasmine Modabar is a transgender person. I am a bisexual person, uh, and uh, I I believe everyone else they're 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 she her. So um, okay, okay. Um, so we have trans identified, and uh, you identify as bisexual. And Reese, um, Reese of course, Reese, she's a she's a young transgender woman who you know. Who is breaking into her career? <laughs> Go Reese. Uh, the star of the show, yes. the star of the film. Yes. Um, it, well, it's fantastic. And, you know, when you see the film and how beautifully it's made and the authenticity that exists in it, you just have to assume that the people that created it have that personal life experience themselves. And I'm so glad that it does because it would be problematic if it didn't, but it it, it really is exciting that it does. So um, was the film released during the pandemic? Yes, we were so lucky. We got our additional photography right before pandemic began. It was literally a few days before everything was shut down, but we had post-production during pandemic. That was a little bit, you know, tricky to navigate because just nobody knew how to organize things. It was a completely new universe and new reality. And we released the movie, um, I think it was last September, uh, September of 2020, uh, during pandemic time. Yeah, being very upset that film festivals will be all, you know, online, but uh, still, I think Katrin, uh, and I do trust her in this point, she said to me, she was like, Ira, we can wait forever. We made a movie to make, like, to let people watch it. And uh, at this point, we just have to release it. Uh, and we have to start submitting to some festivals. And I think she was absolutely right. Yes. The reason I wanted to know that is you probably have not had the privilege of seeing your film with a live audience in person. Unfortunately. Which, which I 
personally believe is one of the greatest rewards for a filmmaker to have that experience. And that's one of the things that hasn't happened. And uh, so I, I do hope for you that opportunity. But the other thing that I've learned from the filmmakers I've interviewed during the last year is that their film ended up reaching a lot more people because film festivals went virtual and those film festivals and screenings were therefore accessible to a lot more people. Uh, was that your experience? I would say it is, but it's just so hard to evaluate because again, when you are coming to film festival, you can see you know people in film theater and what's important for me, I always feel how the audience feels. So, you know, like when you're screening offline uh, and you have live audience right with you there, I know from the beginning whether they like the, the movie or they don't like the movie, if it feels tense, if they're into the story. When you're releasing online, it's just, you know, it's great that people are reaching out to me uh, in social media, texting me how amazing the film was and how it really encouraged them. That's the most important, important part for me. Uh, and I'm happy to receive these messages and I'm happy to see some of the subscribers of Riz Alexander. They recorded their feedback, which was, it was so, I would say it was painful to watch, but uh, you know, cause I, 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 when you see a teenager who is saying, it's just exactly my life and they're about to cry, I'm about to cry with them but I am very happy that this movie can encourage them to you know, keep going, continue to do what they're doing and not let anyone to be on your way. But that's another experience because when you meet people in person, you also have an opportunity you know, to interact with them and support them more and hug them. And in social media, I guess, it's just 50% of emotions what you can you know, exchange and share with people, so. I understand completely, but I can understand why uh, a young, a young trans person, uh, for the audience, the reason I, I, I use the word person is a, a transgender individual might not identify as male or female, they might be gender fluid. And so it, I'm not gonna say a young man or a young woman, it's a young person and that's one of the things we get to learn about how people uh, are coming to know and express their own identities. But I can understand completely why a young trans person would be so powerfully moved by the film uh, in a hopeful way. And uh, I personally could relate because of my own intense decade long or more experience of bullying as a young gay kid growing up in the 19, uh, it would have been the 1970s would have been the decade for me that I was finishing elementary school, going to junior high and going to high school. And some of my deepest traumas come from that experience in my life, particularly connected to the high school experience. Mm -hmm. Although high school was better for me than junior high, I have to say. Um, so there's the the audio uh, the the film is definitely universally universally uh, accessible. I think so. One of our viewers, Karen Bruce, says very interesting. Watching from New Hampshire, what is the name of the film and where can I watch it? Um, so uh, before uh, Ira, before you answer the question where can uh, they watch it? I want to show the trailer again for those people that tuned in late. Here's the trailer of the film, Juliet.
So I'll just throw out there first that one of the goals of going to a film festival is that you'll get distribution and people will pick up the film or maybe if it's a short film, you'll find people that want to help you make it into a feature film. So uh, Ira, do we know when and if uh, the general public can access the film? So it, it's a little bit complicated uh, for now. I believe there is an indie fest, indie short fest, which is happening right now where we will be screening. And I was trying while you were uh, screening the trailer to find the dates, um, but I can't tell you for sure whether it has already happened or uh, it's gonna happen, I believe this week or the next week, but there will be a screening in June. I hope also online screening, but most informers that right after we will be done with uh, film festival uh, circuit, we're gonna release it online. It will be available uh, on Vimeo and everyone will be able to watch it. Um, but until we're in there, we can't unfortunately release it online for the quicker and faster access. Okay then, so for the uh, audience members that wanna know how to track the film at festivals and when it is broadly available, uh, just, uh, Google the filmmaker's name and add the words Juliet film and you'll get ongoing updates. And of course the website is there. And we um, have, uh, we have a social uh, in Instagram, we have a social page for our movie where we are posting all available screenings, which are coming. So, you know, it's like, I can't predict uh, which film festivals will accept us in the future, but once we get accepted, there is always like a window or a few days, uh, sorry, a week or a few days window where you can uh, get the pass and watch the movie. So just follow the Juliet uh, film uh, and Instagram, follow us and you will know when to watch it and where. Is that correct? Right on the screen, is that correct? It should be with Juliet. the Juliet. The Juliet film. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to change that. Oh, sorry. I'm lying to you. It's Juliet the film. One word. Juliet. Okay, let's get that yeah. right for everybody. Uh, I'm the producer, the director, the backstage talent. I do everything here. So is that right? Yes. Okay, so now you have it. Now we all know how to follow the film. And this entire interview will be going to IGTV as well on Promo Homo TV. And I'll be tagging, of course, Juliet the film. Um, so I, I didn't enthusiastically thank you uh, uh, earlier in the interview at the appropriate time, but I think it's so cool that you're out about being bisexual. And that, that just adds to your fierceness in terms of the way you're choosing to live your life as an advocate for women, as an advocate for trans individuals, as a, a, a someone who's fighting for equality on so many levels, as someone who's following your own dreams and you've traveled across the world to do it. So, um, you know, you, you're very, uh, I don't know if, uh, is heroic a gender specific word? Uh, but, uh, I would say that that applies to you if it's not mm -hmm. a gender specific word. <laughs> I, I've seen just so, so many of my friends who are gays and lesbians, they had to leave Russia because of gender discrimination. And I find it very upsetting. And I just, you know, I do believe in the United States and this country uh, is and has been a great example for all other countries. And I just so much hope that the world can learn from the United States. You know, I, I know there is a very hard time right now, but I know the history of this country, it will get better. And, you know, some country, in some countries it, it hasn't, like there is no change for a very, you know, long time. And I just so much hope that it won't be like that in the future and people wouldn't have to leave their own countries in order to live the life what they deserve to leave and in order to be happy. That, that's, that's just my wish because I know it's not only Russia, there are certain other countries where people are experiencing gender discrimination. We might not even know about it because it's just silent. Nobody speaks about it. It's a forbidden topic. And I don't think it should be like that in the world. I think we're in 21st century. Uh, we have to be on another level of social appreciation to each other. Um. One of the things that I'm more aware of in the last year is the reality of white privilege and how I personally have benefited from it. And the fact that so many other 
people that are not white are facing a completely different set of circumstances. Um, uh, in Russia, there would be, I don't know if there's white privilege in Russia, what, what the racial dynamics are there, but there's certainly um, heterosexual privilege. Um, my guess is that your family has means if you've you've come across the country to uh, the world to be in school is 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 um is is privilege somehow associated with your ability to be in the united states um well i guess it was a choice i you know i would say the reason why i can talk very openly about my, you know, sexual privileges and like about being bisexual because my parents are probably are slightly different from the stereotypical, you know, uh, image of Russian parents. And my mom would be when she was growing me up and she, you know, I, I had a girlfriend, we were dating, we were like hanging out in my room and my mom told me, we, I never spoke to my mom about it because, you know, that's not the conversation you want to run with your parents when you were 15. My mom said to me, she said, Ira, I just want you to know, if you decide in your life to marry a woman, I'll be always on your side and I will always support you. And I guess that just was something what I really needed to hear at that time. And it made me calm on a deeper level and I'm not ashamed or afraid. And I was never like that. And even in Russia, I, I would not be talking about it that much, but I would not be hiding or being quiet if the conversation would go that way. Uh, and uh, the decision to go and study in America was, um, you know, it, that was my choice. It was supported by my parents, but it was always about career. And um, I think, um, I think it's important to learn from the best to, and, and learn from best people. And we all know that, you know, especially Los Angeles is famous by having a very big community of uh, filmmakers and uh, it just made total sense. But your parents were in a position financially to help empower yes. you to yes, be Yes, my father, my father is, yes. But it, I, I, don't think, I don't think if it's much about privilege, uh, rather than he's just a very hard working person. And uh, we weren't from like a dynasty of people who were rich. Um, I right, you don't have Fabergé eggs lying in your bookshelves. No, mm -hmm. I just know that he's working hard and I learned it from him. And um, it's also he's investing money into his ch children. And that's, I think, important. That That's very important too. Some parents don't do that in Russia. So, yeah. well. Your story is very inspiring. I I have one more question that I want, well, two more questions that I want to ask you. Um, the first is, I imagine that you're in the United States on a student visa, which means that you have to return to Russia, or perhaps you want to return to Russia, unless you find employment opportunities or perhaps get married to an American. Are those the options? I'm not really considering marriage as an opportunity to, uh, you know, change your documents. Um, no, 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 I wasn't, that's not what I meant. But if you happen to fall in love with someone in the US who was course. a US citizen and get married, that creates, I, I think, a different path for you, but. Yes, yes, but what I'm looking right now, um, yes, being a, being a student uh, in the United States from the foreign country, it means that you just work, you have to work twice as hard in order to prove to the United States that you you belong here, you can work here, and you are the one. So it's always a competition. I treat it more like, you know, it's a healthy competition. It's interesting. It's very hard. But yes, uh, we, we shall see how it's going to be in the future. <laughs> Hopefully. So, we'll so I'm assuming that because you're basically a white individual in your appearance that you avoid with, if you're not speaking, a lot of anti-immigrant uh, hate. Um, is that true? Do, do you sort of navigate around that if people don't realize you're from Russia? And, and have you been the victim of anti-immigrant uh, immigrant hate um, when people understand that you're, you actually are not uh, born and raised in the United States? I would say that uh, AFI Conservatory is 
such a beautiful place where you know we have so many people from every part of the world and everyone is treated with respect and it is interesting and cool to be foreign and it is interesting and cool to be american and we're just exchanging our life experience uh so i i never experienced any discrimination being an fi student but uh not even in the united states and other in, in europe as well i did i i would have situations when you when you're saying that you are from russia uh, men just look at you differently and i would have to clarify that i have no intent and i am not a prostitute and i'm just you know you're not a life. mail order bride yes that's unfortunate i yes. i try to treat it with the humor because i guess it's just an upsetting result from the consequences of the history once when so many women from from after the soviet union was ruined they have to you know immigrate and they couldn't find a job and they had to do what they needed to do in order to survive um i just you know i don't really like cliches and stereotypes but i can't understand where is it coming from and uh there is never you know smoke without without a fire so whenever i i i run into situation like that i'm just you know i'm just trying to explain people that this behavior is not very appropriate and it's not hurting me it's probably hurting them more than me and i never fight i try to do it in a you know in a very nice way in a very friendly way uh there is no reason to fight this you know it's just um cultural i guess disconnection so i think when uh, you're fighting with people they they don't listen to you when you're trying to be friend and you're trying to come explain why it should not be like that they might listen to you that's always works so much better so very well said and i want to just revisit my remark about if you were to marry an american i wasn't uh based on basing that on any sort of stereotypes oh, it's okay. as well <laughs> I, didn't, I, I, didn't I, I i know but i i just want to clarify that um i know from my own experience that many people fall in love from many different places and that is an authentic reason for people to be together and when that exists sometimes it makes the immigration process easier uh, so that was kind of where that question was coming from, trying to uh, understand the different ways you could stay in the United States. Do you have any fear and trepidation about having to go back to Russia, knowing that you have become so open about who you are and created such pow powerful art that kind of takes on the establishment of the country in, from which you come? I, <laughs> I don't, I don't really know, <laughs> because uh, I guess. I don't um I don't calculate all the consequences when I'm in the process of creating a piece, <laughs> a movie. And right now when it's already made and people can watch it, I guess we shall see. I I'm not very scared to go back to Russia, but I would I would not prefer to uh, proceed my career in Russia probably because I think I will have much less opportunity to tell the stories I really want to tell. So to me, it's more about, you know, when you're coming to the United States and everyone is telling you, this is a country of the freedom. This is a country of the, uh, the open voice. And it really is. So we, I really hope I will have chance to stay here and um, to keep developing, um, my creative language um, in filmmaking in the United States, but also, you know, if it happens for me to go back in Russia, I will do my best to try to change the approach and try to raise um, important questions through filmmaking in Russia. That's what I would do then. Because I think there is always a chance to be unique. There is always a chance to create something what, you know, um, what would be shocking for a country, but people will still watch it and they will still, by the end of the day, they will have to accept that this exists. And then you raise some problematic questions and you allow people to start talking about them. I agree with you. I think that the, the more we uh, express our truth, the more that we call into being conversations, even if that conversation is within someone else, if our expression of our truth to them only caused them to have a conversation with themselves, if they don't even have it with us, 
we're, we're starting the process and your film Juliet uh, is so powerful and and uh, transformative for the transgender community. So thank you. I always love to ask my guests an open-ended question at the end of the show, but before I do that, I wanna rem remind you and your director friends to check out my acting clips. Um, for the right project, I'll work for free. You know, I just love to be part of the creative and collaborative process. And that's why they call me the promo homo because I do things like that. But I would like to, in all seriousness, ask you if, is there anything that you would like to say uh, about anything that we have not yet addressed in the interview? I would just like to repeat it one more time for everyone who is watching and, you know, for, I guess, everyone in this world, just keep going and always believe in yourself and never let anyone to be on your way. I think it's very important that you keep your unique voice and you always, it will happen. You will always find a chance to speak up. Uh, I really want to say it for, you know, my fellows who are directors and uh, not only for everyone in the creative field and for uh, everyone in the LGBT, LGBTQA society. And I guess just everyone in general in the world, I think, I know we have gone through a very hard time with pandemic and I know it affected people in so many levels. And I guess it, 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 it has been a very lonely time for a lot of people. And I just think that right now, hopefully we're coming back to the life we had before and there will be much more opportunities for everyone to grow up you know, and evolve and speak up and develop their creative voices. Well, for your first broadcast interview, I want to say you have done an excellent job of uh, participating today. So congratulations. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me today. Um, it was very exciting and your questions were amazing. And thank you so much for, um, for screening the Juliet teaser. And I hope everyone will get a chance who is interested to watch the movie. Well, they certainly know where to find it and how to follow you as your career blossoms. So thank you again. Stay where you are and I'll speak with you briefly after the show. Thank you. For those of you watching, you know, you know, my own personal mission statement is to honor and express my creativity in a way that makes a difference. And the fundamental purpose of my journalism is connecting the circuitry of humanity. And because of that, I find that I get to have conversations like you've just viewed today. It's one of the joys of my life to support uh, people like Arena. And I'm so glad that you had the opportunity to, to tune in. And I will see you next time. And I just can't get enough of your energy